<laughs> I've been I've been up a few chimneys in my time, you know, but I've never been up one quite with as nice a surroundings as this one. This week's look at the construction skills that went into the building of Britain has brought me north of the border to see a style that's distinctively Scottish and to look at one of the most important works of a Scottish architect who changed all that. In fact, Robert Adams' style of building was so distinctive it was named after him. This is Glam's Castle, the childhood home of the Queen Mother, the birthplace of Princess Margaret, and the legendary setting for Macbeth. It's also been a royal residence since the 14th century, and is one of the best examples of the Scottish baronial style in existence. It's a style that was developed in the 16th and 17th centuries, as much for visual effects as for any practical need. What it involved was adding a whole lot of magnificent decorative features to existing clan castles. The wall castle is a grand collection of medieval architectural bits. The beautiful crenellated parapet walls and all the turrets and pinnacles and finials and round chimney stacks. It's all quite wonderful and fairy tale like. 600 years ago, Glam started out as a simple tower house and it didn't change very much for another 200 years. Because the great sandstone tower was too massive to demolish, they had to build all round it when they wanted to extend the castle. The first of the extensions and improvements that transformed Glam's from a medieval castle into a great house in the Scottish baronial style were done in 1603 when the ninth Lord Glam's was made an Earl by King James VI. To match his new status, he wanted an HQ that looked a bit more impressive than the old tower. He added two floors and, and an attic, and of course, the, in, tucked in the corner of the L shape of the original tower is the new staircase. The Earl was his own architect, and although there are no records, it's believed that he employed masons of the Aberdeen School under the direction of John Bell, and what a magnificent job they did. The new staircase was added by the first Earl, and on a grand scale, you know, it's a sort of 16 feet diameter, and magnificently illuminated by the amount of windows that are in it. And of course, building it, they would have started off with a, a, a circle, 16 feet diameter, stuck on the foundation blocks, and then inserted the first tread. You know, it's nice how they're all radiused off on the inside, so you don't get the effect of great thick slabs of stone. As they were inserting these treads coming up, they would pull the wall up, you know, with them as they were coming up the steps, but they'd come apart where they couldn't reach, you see, so they would then have put logs coming across from these holes here like this onto the centre, there's like one there and there's another one up there what they could stand on while they got the wall, the outer wall higher up there to get the next set of treads on as you might say oh, it's quite an interesting staircase I'm up here on the roof of the castle amongst all the pinnacles and finials and beautiful iron railings and flagpoles and what have you I mean, the bit that interests me most is the is the slated steeples, you know, like a lot of people don't realise that underneath the slates there's quite a lot of complex woodwork that's all beautifully tapered off and rounded off. If you ever had to have it re-slated today, it'd be a fairly expensive job. Really, it's a job for a good steeple job. This is a little drawing I've done of one of the turrets on Clarm's Castle, the basic construction of the woodwork. They must have used steeple jacking technology, you know, great blocks of timber uh, pinned to the side of the circular part of the, uh, of the turret and, and then a few planks round that they could stand on. Once they'd got this circular wall plate resting on top of the stonework, which would be in maybe four or five pieces, they would then lift up these rafters, you know, on the end of a rope. They wouldn't be that heavy. You, you could actually hold one in position while you nailed it to the, to the wall plate. 
the slate lats to get them to curve round the fairly tight curve as you get in towards the top. They, they would saw saw cuts in the back of it, so you, you know you get round maybe a foot diameter or uh, thereabouts. You know, with a fairly simple, you know, um, and all. And then the, the slates would be nailed on in the usual manner. At the bottom, where they're about seven or eight inches wide, they'd have two nails. And as you went up progressively, as the things get smaller, maybe at the top only one nail, and then the wall lock cap with its lead finial or pinnacle or whatever, the vision or the, the look at it from down below is very pleasing, you know, it looks really nice. Back in the days of the first Earl, when all this building work started, this is what the inside of the castle would have looked like. This is the lower hall of the original 15th century tower house. It's one of the places that's changed the least in all the castle, you know, it's not been messed about with. It's really a wonderful bit of building. It almost reminds you of a railway tunnel, doesn't it? It's magic. It's all quite a mystery in this barrel vaulted chamber. Like there's two distinct lines along the ceiling where the material changes. The full length of the room, you know, it's the same material as the, the tapered arch window openings are built out of. It seems to me as though they could have been put in these windows because there's a pretty nasty joint down around the arch and down each side. And all bits of the different material, you know, to like block up the gaps and what have you. It's all very interesting. I could live in here myself. It's quite nice, you know, beautiful. Up here on the second floor, this magnificent room was once the great hall of the central tower. And of course, until its conversion in the 17th century, it would have looked very, very similar to the room we've just come from downstairs. The first earl proceeded to convert it into this magnificent drawing room. He had all the walls plastered and the fireplace done and the royal arms stuck in the middle. The second Earl continued the process when he employed travelling Italian craftsmen to create the fine arch ceiling of beautiful old plasterwork. But all this splendour that had been brought to Clams didn't last very long because in 1646 the second Earl died a ruined man, his estates plundered and with debts of £40,000 which in them days were a ginormous sum. When his son Patrick succeeded him, he managed to pay off all the debts and then, in 1670, he moved back into the castle and began an ambitious programme of extensions and improvements. I'm hidden away up here in the top of the clock tower where all the records for the castle are kept and I found the third Earl's diary and he, he, he actually called it his Book of Record. And of course, in it, he detailed all the expenses and the building operations that were going on. And, and it starts off with what it was like when Ephus came to look at it. And it says here, it be an old house and consequently was the more difficult to reduce the place to any uniformity. In other words, it were all idly piddly and what have you, you know. It I did cover it extremely to order my building so that the front piece might have a resemblance on both sides. In other words, he made it symmetrical by placing one wing on either side of the central tower, with both of them coming out at right angles from it. Not only are there all his records in this book, but also his dealings with the contractors and the actual contracts that they've got. And this one's a, an interesting one, dealing with one of his main contractors. And it says, he's his lordship's very unhappy with the uh, with the bill that he's just received. It says, Sanders Nisbet, as to your pretended additional work, in other words, he must have billed him for a bit extra, I, I shall receive this answer without passion. First, I must tell you that I admire with what impudence you charge me any additional work. Then he goes on to say, if you, if you read the contract properly, you know, you finished job off. And then he finishes... But Sanders, there are a great many things to be done which are as yet not done and must be done. But in spite of the odd disagreement, Nisbet was still the main contractor for all the work. According to another of the contracts, Nisbet had to provide five masons to work with him on site, 
while the Earl was to provide all the materials and the services of four workmen for the unskilled labour. There have been all sorts of extensions and improvements done since the time of the third Earl, especially in Victorian times. But what we see today as we look down the mile-long avenue at the 100 foot high towers is basically what he created when he turned a medieval castle into a great house. Extending and beautifying an existing tower wasn't the only way that a distinctive Scottish style was developed. By the 18th century, the leading Scottish architect, William Adam, began to design country houses that broke away radically from the baronial style. The House of Dunn near Montrose is one of his finest country houses. Like Glam's, they started off with a great tower here, but rather than building the house round it, they actually knocked it down and started again on a greenfield site. It was built by David Erskine, the Lord of Dunn, who was a prosperous lawyer. Work began in 1730 and it took over 10 years, a bit like one of my jobs. But really, you can see why, you know, and if you compare it with Glam's Castle, with the rough stone and the big wide joints, you know, I mean, these joints and these stones, you cannot even get your, your fingernail in to get them such a good fit, you know, and all these beautiful reeded columns, uh, uh, every, every stone's done individually, and of course everything up fit to a degree of perfection. If you put your eye to the corner, you know, the dead straight, you know, you cannot fault it. In fact, straighter than what they get it these days, I reckon. The great glory of the interior of the House of Dunn is this magnificent saloon with its wonderful plastering which are done by a man called Joseph Enser. And believe it or not, for all this magnificent ornamentation, he only got 216 quid, you know. It sounds unbelievable, isn't it? That weren't just for plastering this one single room, it was for doing the wall house. Most people coming into this room wouldn't have a, a great deal of idea how all this magnificent work were done. But going back to my days at art school, they, they had an ornamental plastering department, and even though I never did any myself, I, I always took great interest in what was going on in there. And of course, they made nearly everything uh, on, on flat benches, and then glued and screwed them to the walls in strange ways. If there were any funny shapes to have nice, things fixed to, like in here we've got this wonderful radius from the Cornish moulding up to the flat ceiling proper. They made a curved board of exactly the same radius to make all these cannons and ladies and fancy bits to that radius, you see. And so all the fancy pieces would fit to the same curve, as you might say. And there's also lots of other things of interest in here, because up there there's reputed to be a real violin that's been dipped in a, in a watery solution of plaster. And there's other interesting things like shells up there, but they've got to be real shells. To find out some of the tricks of the trade, I went to see the experts. Hales and Howe are specialists in ornamental plaster work. I spoke to the managing director, David Harrison, and asked him about those violins. The trouble with that theory is if you dip a violin in a bucket of plaster and you pull it out, what you've got is a violin covered in plaster, and that's not what these look like. They would have sculpted it. They probably would have used a, a timber frame and modelled up the plaster surface on that. Things like the strings would be possibly a copper wire oh, they're, they're or something real like copper that, wire, so yeah. that wouldn't go rusty any trick that they could use to save having to model something. They, for example, the, the, there's a spear, which is very delicate. That wouldn't stay together in plaster. So that's probably just a piece of timber dowel with a, with a point on the end. It's just placed in there. Yeah, something like that, over at fireplace, that'd be made on a bench, no doubt, uh, you know, flat, and then raised up, would it not? The way they would have done that would be to simply uh, model the thing up on a timber frame with an armature on the back, held it up, and actually just put a bit of wood through to the joist and nailed it on. All of these heavy items, they would have made absolutely certain whether they were modelling from the, from the surface of the ceiling outwards or applying something. All the big bits have armatures running through, like statues, like anything that could fall off. Um, uh, they have to make sure that it's not going to fall on their client's head. 
and now into the workshop to meet the technical director, Bob Lewis. This is the nice. plaster we're using. Right. Plaster Paris, it's a fine casting plaster. Yeah. We sprinkle this always into the water. Yeah. Never it water onto the plaster. Right. Give it a it's good mix. Mm. And then pour it into the mould. Lovely. Make sure the plaster is evenly spread into all the corners. Before all this wonderful latex stuff, what, what would they have, uh, you know, used in the bad old days like? Well, there was yeah. very little moulds as such, actually spun and then carved in the ceiling. Lovely, eh? Yeah. Then you give it a key to fix the backing to. <laughs> That's it. Ooh. Cut that bit. Oh, come on, it's set in. Normally from a bolted fur, it can be... Yeah. Yeah, cos I can see what happens next. It's That's all it. folded over, isn't it? That's it. That's the tricky bit, isn't it? The last of there for reinforcement. It's all rubbed down below the surface. I think I could get used to it eventually. These pieces that we're doing are going to be for some Jacobean strap work. I can see you've used plaster before. <laughs> oh, concrete. <laughs> for long sections of cornice moulding, the technique's a bit different. Let's put the plaster down to start with. We'll bring it just up to the edge. Make sure the mould is well filled. Then comes the critical bit, drawing the template along the wall length of the mould to give the cornice its shape. Now that it's dry, we'll go back to the strap work. Right, now delicately, we just make sure it's all nicely released around the outside. Quite, uh, quite strong. This is it. This is where it all yeah. falls apart. heavier than you think, all right. And there we go. A couple of bubbles, but we can sort that out. Yeah. Oh, is the cornice going to turn out just as good? Pull that round. That'll be, uh, yeah. Hope it go on the ceiling and the wall. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, all right. All right, three items of full time. <laughs> William Adam had set a new trend for house design and decoration in Scotland. But it was Adam's more famous son, Robert, who took some elements of this style and added a lot of ideas of his own to create a style of architecture that's named after him. Robert Adam had spent three years travelling around Europe drawing and studying the great buildings from the past. He was particularly impressed by the remains of the ancient Roman buildings he saw. And it was this that influenced the Adam style more than anything else. Cowain Castle on the Ayrshire coast is one of its most important and distinctive works. Adam was commissioned to rebuild an existing castle seen here in one of his own sketches. His idea was to transform this into a romantic-looking castle designed to heighten the dramatic cliff-top setting. Adam worked on Culain over a period of 15 years, from 1777 to 1792. His pupil, Hugh Kerncross, was the foreman for the wall project, and Hugh's brother, William, was the carpenter. The work was done in several stages. First of all, he incorporated the original building into the south side of the mansion. He squared up the central tower and refaced it, and then built a, a three-storey wing on each side. The sandstone was quarried locally, some actually coming from beneath the castle itself, when it was removed to make the foundations and the cellar. The next stage of his building work was the north wing, with its massive drum tower on the seaward side. He built this wonderful round tower to sit right on the edge of the cliff. It's a sheer drop for about 100 feet down to the shoreline. Immediately below us, there's a great cave, and he must have been a bit unsure of himself because he's built a big stone pillar in the middle of the cave, just in case. And he obviously built it to, for the beautiful panoramic views of the countryside and the sea and everything. It's quite a magnificent thing, really, perched here, right on the edge. It stood the test of time. It's all still here. It's slightly eroded. It's 
it's facing the western elements and the Atlantic in a way, so it's took a bit of beating over the years it's been here. Adam's brief extended to the wall of the Colain Estate. Not only did he build the house, you know, he, he built that wonderful viaduct as part of the grand entrance to the place. Even the clock tower, which of course were already there, he smartened up with the turrets and the crannulated top, and of course a new skin down the front. And the castle's farm that was built to his design is a work of art in itself. You won't find many farms that look as good as this. There's an awful lot of stone about this castle. The trouble is, most of it came from the Earl's personal quarry, and it's sandstone, which is not the best stuff for weathering the, the storm, as you might say, you know. I mean, here there's the most magnificent example of erosion. The whole thing's just worn away with the, the wind and the, the sea air, I suppose. For years now, they've been replacing the outer skin on the front of the building. There's only about maybe a couple of dozen of the original Adam blocks still in position. You know, they're the dirty ones. Yeah. This is Andy Bradley, who's been here for 10 years. He's never been home, and he's the resident stonemason. You know, he does all the maintenance of the stone and all the repairs and all the nice bits, you know. Isn't that right? It is. <laughs> well, yeah. Yeah. Right, this is this is how you get it, is it now, right? This is how we started getting the stone in, yeah. Yeah, big big slabs. And we've no set sizes. No, Everything's it's like, yeah, different various sizes, yeah. different uh, lengths, yeah. different bed yeah. heights. I suppose when Robert Adam were here, it had just come in pretty rough lumps, wasn't it? You know. Sure. It'd be, yeah. it'd be split down smaller than this at the yeah. quarry. They would have had great difficulty yeah. transporting yeah. Oh, a block yeah, this well. size. So they'd split the stuff down yeah. at the quarry mm. and dress it into rough sizes, mm. roughly squared blocks. Mm. Yeah. And then at that point, those stones would be designated for a particular mm. task. Mm. There'd mm. maybe be some that were long yeah. enough to be window mm. heads, yeah, yeah, some that yeah. would go for yeah. jams. So they wouldn't have a, re a great amount to remove. No, well, you try and work the minimum. Yeah. Mm. Mm. Um, but what that's done over the mm. years, it's given a variety. Mm. I mean, you know yourself, you come to a building of a certain age. Oh yeah, beautiful, big ones, Ev little ones. Everything and, will be yeah. slightly different. So it's far easier for us to get the stone just in random lengths mm. and cut it to suit, um, as they would have done originally. Anyway. Shall we go and have a look on yeah, the scaffold what, and see what, what this is for? Uh, with your retaining wall? Yeah, mm. go and have a look. This place is rather inaccessible, isn't it? On top of a cliff, you know? Mm -hmm. Well, like most places in those days, they tried to get the stone you know, as local as possible. There's three basic stones at Colain, all within a few miles of the castle itself. This is actually uh, a retaining wall. Mm -hmm. On the top of it's the road to the castle. Yeah. Um, Tarmac Road, so that might have an effect. Yeah, one on with the, the drainage. side of it. Yeah, mm. up on the top here. Yeah. It's the main drag up to the castle. Yeah. Um, <coughs> and when you look at it, you mm. know, it looks out over the gas house. It's yeah. not seen from the castle. No, um, yeah, but even gone... even in a place like this, yeah. they've gone to a bit of effort. Oh, you know, they've yeah, put this that. dental course, yeah, yeah. this mould in here, yeah, and nice. then these cannons, which are... Yeah, yeah. Well, this one <laughs> alone is purely ornamental. Oh, there's no wall up the middle. Just ornament. It must be difficult deciding which which stones to pull out and which to leave in, you know, like, how do you do it? You, I'd be having sleepless nights if it were me. We want to keep the character of the wall pretty well intact. Um, so we'll try and take out as little as possible whilst still maintaining the structural integrity of the wall. Just because it's badly weathered, it's not an excuse for taking it out. Mm. Want a nice rough surface on there. Yeah. Every single stone has to be prepared by hand, and key. this includes Apparently getting a nice rough surface on it so the mortar will key. Building up the rhythm. Yeah, it's it is, isn't it, really? Like, when you think that every line is a blow from a man's arm and an hammer and chisel. When this place were being built, there'd be dozens, literally dozens, of stonemasons. The thing is, this is a wonderful wall to sort of depict different styles of, of workmanship on the producing the squared off blocks of stone. I mean, it's obvious that 
the same man made these door jams, you know, each side, it's the same style of chiselling. There's a wonderfully detailed one here that, that obviously the guy who made that would only do one. And the bloke who made this one would more than likely do three, you know, because it's pretty rough, you know, sort of thing, or he were in an hurry to go home for his tea or something of that nature. They dropped a bit of a clangor here. There was going to be another niche like that, but they obviously changed their mind and, and bunged it up. But it is certainly a good example of showing Mason's different styles of, you know, using the punch and the mallet and the, and the various fancy chisels that they have. But Adam's work isn't just about stonework and exteriors. He spent as much time worrying about the inside as the out. Especially important was his conviction that the interior of a building, right down to the decoration and the furnishings, should be the concern of the architect. This room, really, with its magnificent ceiling, it's not too much overdone, is it? Light and elegant. And really, it's typical of his style, you know, he, he sort of kept everything lovely and sort of light looking. And really, he's chiefly remembered for his interiors, his beautiful fireplaces and his door heads and, and this rather wedding cake type plastering. We're well, not too heavy about any of it. You know. This is Robert Adams's crowning glory, a masterpiece. When he'd finished off the north and south side of the house, he was left with this rather sunless and dark rectangular shaped courtyard in between that separated the two. And 10 years later, after he'd started work, he came up with this wonderful idea that gives a feeling of light and space. There wasn't enough room for a conventional circular spiral staircase. So Adam made it oval. And I rather think when he first knocked his ruler out and measured this rectangular shaped courtyard, he did a bit of head scratching before he came up with this magnificent thing. He must have marked out the elliptical row of pillars in the bottom which are joined together with arches. And then, of course, when they end up at the landing where the lovely cast iron handrail is, there are 12 Corinthian columns which support a gallery up above with another 12 smaller in diameter ionic columns which support a magnificent elliptical dome with a beautiful fan light in the top of it that lets all the light stream in. I don't think really that I've ever been in a building where wherever you stand, if you stand square across the thing and look up, everything's in perfect alignment. It's quite magnificent. If it were round, it wouldn't be so bad, but it's elliptical as well. I mean, the amount of accuracy is incredible. The wall effect is very dramatic and very typical of Robert Adam, the only man in the story of the building of Britain to have a style named after him all of his own. The wall place is a magnificent monument, not just to the imagination and ingenuity of Robert Adam, but also to the workmanship and hard graft of the men who actually built it.